it's great for Carrie and I to be here. Carrie taught here in a previous year, two or three years ago. Um, I don't know why she left me behind last time. I don't remember what the occasion <laughs> was, but I'm happy to be here this year. Uh, and, and, and I'm grateful to everyone here, to Colgate, and in particular to Jennifer Bryce, who's um, a former colleague of ours and our dear, dear friend. And I've never forgiven her for leaving us at Swoopar, but um, um, we're, we're so happy to be here with her this week. So I'm going to read the, the opening of this novel. I hope that's OK. Um, and uh, unlike poets who often need, who know things, I don't know anything. So <laughs> I've got nothing to explain to you prior to, to beginning the reading. So, but this is a novel, it's, it's a novel that's, uh, I spent many years writing that's about, uh, I'm going to talk about the writing of this novel in the context of the craft talk later this week, so I won't say too much, but it's, it's a novel that arose out of my own, um, I grew up in New Orleans, it's a, it's a novel that's about a guy who uh, leaves New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and ends up in the part of Virginia where Carrie and I have lived for, for the last 20 years. Um, we spent this last year, as Kevin suggested, in, in, in Massachusetts, in Deerfield, but are returning back to Sweet Bird, uh this summer. The, the, the genesis of the novel is my thinking about dislocation, <coughs> the, the fact that, that I lived all those years in New Orleans, and then the, the house that I lived in in New Orleans was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, my mother's house. And um, I had already <coughs> left, but my work had been my previous novels were situated there. And so it, it, it caused me to think about the kind of dislocation of my own imaginative landscape. And so I created a character who's nothing like me. I want you to understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who is dislocated from, from New Orleans as a result of the storm. Anyway, you'll, you'll see the beginning of it. I hope it'll be enough to if you someday want to read it. In Virginia, and I can move, I can move, but I'm not bound. This is, <laughs> it's like having my own TV show. It's awesome. uh, oh, and speaking of which, even though this, this, this is such a sad circumstance, if, if it happens to be funny, it's okay to laugh. <laughs> um, you don't have to be embarrassed. You probably won't laugh, and then I'll feel horrible. But anyway, um, excuse me. Could you tell us when to laugh? <laughs> no, wait. When I wave my hand like this. <laughs> oh, Lord. okay. It's, I knew it was going to begin, begin badly, and I was just hoping it gets better. Um, okay, so I'll read a few pages from the beginning of this novel. In the Virginia, three days later, Henry Garrett finally saw it all on TV. He stopped at a motel on Route 29, somewhere north of Lynchburg, the dim outline of Blue Ridge Mountains rising behind the motel's dusty gray brick walls. And the short, round Indian woman behind the counter, her painted fingernails adorned with glitter, took a look at the address Henry had printed on the registration card, pushed back toward him the three crumpled $20 bills he placed on the counter, and said, you will stay with our compliments, Mr. Garrett. You'll stay as long as you would like to stay. You've lost everything, yes. Just tonight, Henry said. Tomorrow. But the woman reached across the counter and touched his arm. Her fingernails, a pale blue beneath the glitter, gently grazed his skin as she took her hand away. With our compliments, Mr. Garrett, she said. Tonight, tomorrow, as long as you would like to be our guest, we, can do, we cannot do so much, but this we can do. You've lost everything. Everything, Henry thought. He considered the word, and he lost everything. Again, though, the woman didn't wait for Henry. She swept around the counter, confidently hoisted his canvas bag, and led him out the office door, a red and orange sari, glowing like a torch in the dim light of the parking lot. The motel appeared to be empty, unoccupied, Henry thought, as if it were a foreign land. But she led him down the line of rooms to the last one. Two windows, front and side, she said, much nicer for you than the others. Inside the room, the woman switched on the light, 
pointed out the coffee pot on the bathroom's vanity and turned on the television. Some company, she said, but it is like the old ones, I do not know why, it requires a few minutes to warm. She stood there scowling at the television as though it were a disobedient child. So Henry took his bag from her, set it on the bed, and looked around the room. On the wall above the headboard was a painting of what seemed to be a bearded child sailing through the night sky. One of the child's outstretched hands held a feather, apparently plucked from the red swan flying beside him. The other hand clutched a wooden stick, or maybe a flute. Below the painting, on a wicker nightstand, stood a small black lamp with a paper shade depicting a pot-bellied Ganesh. Henry switched on the lamp, and the figure lit up. He studied the bejeweled crown, the great floppy ears, and elephant's trunk. Ganesh was a king of sorts, some kind of Hindu god Henry knew. But that was all he knew, really. He leaned closer and saw that Ganesh was squatting on a rat, one with an absurdly long tail wrapped twice around Ganesh's corpulent waist. The exact same lamp, Henry now realized, had been on the motel's office counter. Beneath it had been a bowl of green striped mints and a stack of brochures for some place named the Lucky Caverns. Henry stepped back toward the woman, but she hadn't moved. The television still had not come on. The screen was black, except for a small circle of gray light at the center. So Henry told her not to worry, that he would be fine without it. Really, he said, I'll be fine, which made him want to laugh. He would not be fine. Well, I am Latanji, she said, and she began to spell out the name, though she did so in a sort of nonsense sing-song verse. L is in library, A is in love, T is in telegraph lines, flowering above. I I'm sorry, Henry said, A is in love, there's no, yes, yes. The woman raised her hand, <laughs> Latanji, she said again. Its meaning is slim girl, she laughed. My father was hopeful, yes, but not wise. <laughs> Good, I'm not even having to raise my hand. <laughs> Her shoulders swung side to side as if she were about to dance. Henry tried to smile. The woman reached out and handed him the room key, but suddenly felt a bit but he suddenly felt a bit dizzy, dehydrated perhaps, and he dropped the key. When he bent down to retrieve it, he saw that the worn and faded carpet covering the room was piled with an almost invisible purple and black paisley design and that on her feet beneath her sari, the woman was wearing gold sandals, her toenails painted the same pale glittery blue as her fingernails. Thank you so much, Henry said standing, a bit off balance. The woman reached toward him, gently touched his arm, but then Henry felt her grip tighten. Oh, the woman gasped, oh, oh. Henry followed her eyes to the television. On the screen, a mangy dog stood on a dresser floating in the middle a flooded street. The houses submerged the roof lines, the water <coughs> surface oily, dappled pink and green. The shot zoomed in so close that Henry could see the dog shaking, struggling to keep its balance on the dresser. Then the images flashed by in a rapid fire montage of ruin and desperation. A man's body floating face down in the water, a shirt billowing mouth around him. Two children hoisted in a yellow bucket from a rooftop to a helicopter. A shirtless old man with a scarred chest and long gray beard squatting on the concrete steps of a house that lay in a heap behind him. A man wading through waist-deep water with a bone-thin old woman cradled in his arms, the woman's hands and feet dangling in the water. The volume on the television was turned down, but Henry felt as though he could hear the dramatic music that must be accompanying these images, the martial drumbeats, the groaning strings, the staccato burst of horns. When the red CNN logo swirled onto the screen, Henry turned to look at the woman, and he saw that she was weeping. I'm terribly, terribly sorry, Mr. Garrett. You're home, yes. You were raised there. The woman continued crying. Everything, she said. Everything. Henry wanted to tell her that he was fine. He wanted somehow to comfort her. Latanji, he said, trying to pronounce the name just as the woman had pronounced it. Latanji, yes, she said. Latanji, I but he couldn't think of a way to say it, to explain that he had already managed, before the hurricane, to lose everything. This is my home, I've lived there my whole life, but... Now he reached out to touch her arm. As if his hand had somehow set her in motion, though, she began to drift toward the door. Henry thought of the child in the painting with the plucked swan's feather. You will sleep tonight, yes, Mr. Garrett. 
the time you said. Her head turned away as if she were afraid that Henry had already begun undressing. If there's anything at all, she said, but she gently closed the door before she completed the sentence. Henry sat down on the bed and stared at the television. He leaned forward and tried to turn up the volume. There was still no sound. On screen, a white-haired reporter, Henry knew his name but couldn't remember it right then, stood atop a highway overpass rising out of the water like an amusement park ride. He pointed behind him and shook his head, flames and black smoke pouring from the roof of a building in the distance, all but its top two floors submerged in water. Henry knew that this was New Orleans, that this was what he had left behind, what had happened in these past three days, but he had not imagined, could not have imagined when he left, that it would be so bad. Yes, people had been talking about the hurricane, how it might be more powerful than Betsy or Camille, but he had decided to leave only when he saw, by late afternoon, that Magazine Street was completely empty, as if it were a morning after her Mardi Gras, and everyone in the city was hungover and sleeping in. Then the police cars had started passing, flashing their blue lights and announcing over a loudspeaker that the city was closed, that everyone had to be gone by dark. Can you close the city? Henry had wondered. How do you close the city? He'd left without any real sense of panic, feeling a bit like a daydreaming first grader during a fire drill, dutifully falling into the long line of children shuffling out through the elementary school's heavy double doors. He'd inch forward for five hours in the traffic until he was finally able to get off the interstate. He found a gas station in Mississippi that was still open, and he waited in line there for another hour to fill up his tank. After that, he drove aimlessly along back roads that cut through farmland and pine woods, returning every now and then to the interstate, but getting off again when the traffic slowed to a crawl. From time to time, he checked the road atlas to make sure he was headed more or less north. He ate fast food, washed his hands and face in the restaurant's grimy bathrooms. He spent the first night at a rest stop because all the motels he passed were full, the parking lots jammed with boats and trailers and overstuffed station wagons. All he brought was a canvas bag into which he'd thrown some underwear and shirts and a couple pairs of jeans. He no longer owned much else. Throughout the drive, he kept hearing in his head the absurd lyrics of some song of a song some concave-chested acne scarred teenager with a tongue stud had played for him a few days ago at the store. A few days ago, before everything was like this, before what he was watching on the TV. The song was by a band called the Mountain Goats. Though it wasn't really a band, the kid had carefully explained. Each flash of metal in his mouth leaving Henry a bit woozy, as if it were his own tongue that had been impaled. The band was really just one guy, the teenager said. A guy who'd been a psychiatric nurse hopped up on amphetamines, though he was now completely clean, a vegan even, maybe a Buddhist or something too. And Henry had listened to the singer's nasally voice and his badly tuned guitar. The song apparently recorded onto a cassette tape in a boombox of this mountain goat man's Portland or Seattle bathroom. I hope when you think of me years down the line, you can't find one good thing to say. And I'd hope that if I found the strength to walk out, you'd stay the hell out of my way. Ah, a love song, Henry had joked. <laughs> and the boy had nodded, his head frenetically bobbing up and down. You got it, the boy said. You must definitely have got it. Henry listened. Everything about the song should have been perfectly awful. But it wasn't, or rather it was. It was both perfect and awful. It was indeed a love song, a swirling mixture of bitterness and vile and desperate longing. I'm drowning, the singer screamed at the end, which must have been why the song had wound up in Henry's head. The image of water and drowning, the bitterness and desperation as he drove away from the storm. I'm drowning, there's no sign of land. You're coming down with me, hand in unlovable hand, and I hope you die. I hope we both die. Of course, I hope you die. I hope we both die. Oh boy. Henry couldn't explain, even to himself, why he liked such music. He just did. He liked the off key, the unbalanced, the anguish, the forlorn, the guttural rumblings of Tom Waits, Dylan's scratching claws, Skip James's cracking falsetto, Lou Reed's drone, Johnny Cash's hoarse whisper, Billie Holiday near the end, when her voice was gone, and every word she sang seemed tormented, shot through with pain. Doomed. Actually, it wasn't that he liked these voices exactly, or that he thought the lyrics of these songs, in any songs really, 
were communicating anything profound, but there was something there, something imperfect, something sharp and bent and rusty that tore into him somehow, that made him believe the human condition was one great and mournful but still achingly beautiful cry. Maybe the explanation was as simple as what Amy, his wife, had said again and again with ever diminishing affection, that he was deep down still just a dopey adolescent kid, as absurd as that tongue-studded teenager, forever filled with longing, forever admiring all the bruises and black eyes and jagged scars he'd accumulated through the years. But Amy, his wife, once his wife, still his wife, no longer his wife, Amy was not a kid. She was anything but a kid. Had that been the problem, that even at 41, he was still a child, and she was not. But Henry's, by Henry's second day of driving, the drowning song had evaporated, drummed out of his head by the sheer monotony of the road, by the trees and utility poles and the mile markers and billboards he shot past. He had no idea where he was going. He wound up somewhere in southern Georgia. He bought some fruit at a roadside stand, and as the old man there put the plums and peaches into a plastic bag, he said something about the storm and about the rice fields growing best under a foot or more of water. But the old man's speech was so garbled, his accent so thick, that Henry couldn't really understand him. Thank you, Henry said, nodding, when the man handed him the plastic bag. You better ship a dare black or take a machine, I'm telling you, the man called out. Henry reached his car. Yes, yes, goodbye, Henry said, <laughs> nodding again and waving as if he understood perfectly what the man had said. More and more, Henry had realized as he drove away, that was happening to him. People spoke in ways that he didn't understand. Their accents, their words, the language that they used, all of it seemed to reach him as if it were being transmitted through tin cans and string. That night, he'd simply turned onto a gravel road and parked next to an overgrown baseball field. The red lights of the scoreboard mysteriously switched on. Go Spartans, the scoreboard said, though the home team had been down 3-0 in the sixth. By the third day, was it really the third day, Henry wondered? He had no idea where he was. He'd heard a few things on the car radio, reports of a breached levee, of a Superdome crowded with those who'd stayed behind, of Mir Nagin angrily pleading for help. But he hadn't wanted to hear it, hadn't wanted to know. He no longer wanted information, the endless stream, scream, stream of disjointed facts that his mind took in, but somehow couldn't process, as if his brain were a sponge left soaking too long in dirty water. As a kid, he'd been proud of his mental acuity, his ability to memorize minute details, baseball players' batting averages and long geometry equations, song titles, and the dialogue from TV shows in nearly all the capital cities in the world from Addis Ababa to Yerevan. He'd come to understand, though, with a kind of sullen relief, no longer would he have to bear the prodigy's awful burden, that he was exactly the opposite of brilliant, the opposite of someone who could with just a few pertinent facts, solved the most complex of problems. He could memorize an encyclopedia's <coughs> worth of information and still be able to figure out nothing. Sometimes before he left his job and everything else behind, when he was teaching his 11th grade American Lit class, expounding on, say, the narrative tricks and turns that Faulkner is up to in As I Lay Dying, He'd step away from the blackboard and realize that he'd scribbled so much there that not one word of it was legible. That he had produced a kind of portrait in black and white of his own adult mind. No wonder his students often seemed shell-shocked, mouths open, pens frozen above their spiral notebooks. How could they possibly figure out what they were supposed to remember? Instead of listening to the news reports then, He'd quickly scan through the radio stations until he wound up tuned to the frenzied sermon of some evangelical preacher. When he moved beyond the reach of that Christian station, he easily found another, and then another after that. He didn't exactly listen to what these preachers were shouting, but he found himself transfixed, just as he had been as a child, by the eerie discordant music of their voices, by the rising and falling incantation, and the congregation's dark murmurings of assent. 
Hammond B3 organs punctuating the complex rhythms of hand claps and foot stomps and shouts, the rapid fire ricochet of call and response. Sit at his feet and be blessed, one of these preachers shouted, and a hundred voices, maybe a thousand, answered straight away, Amen. Keep my mind stayed on thee, and the voices replied, Amen. Expect to be landed upon the shore. Meet me over in the city that's not made by hand. They tell me that city is made for a square. I want to go there, gates upon the north and south, gates upon the east and west. I want to go there. I'm clamoring to go there. Lord, make a way out of no way. Amen. Henry had silently chimed in. The cavernous echo of these broadcasts made them sound to him like indecipherable but urgent transmissions from another realm. He thought, of course, about his father, who'd been a professor at Tulane, an anthropologist who'd begun long before Henry was born, frequenting such churches throughout Louisiana and Mississippi, recording and transcribing the sermons and hymns. Henry's father had written his dissertation on sorrow songs throughout the world, examining the shared traumatic thematic strains of gypsy cantatas, Portuguese fados, black spirituals, and Delta blues. Henry had once heard someone describe his father as a song catcher, and he remembered as a young child picturing him wearing khaki fatigues and holding a giant net, swinging it in wide circles as if he might somehow sweep these songs from the air the way scientists would capture butterflies in a field of wildflowers. He remembered his father once telling someone, a colleague, a student, Henry himself, or Mary, his sister, that the only thing he was an absolute expert at was longing and loss. And now Henry had become an expert on that as well. He had lost everything, yes, just as Latanji had said. But as he tried to tell her, it hadn't been the hurricane that had done it. He'd lost everything months ago, nearly a year now, in fact. Everything, Henry thought hearing Latanji's lilting voice as he sat on the motel room bed, still transfixed by the images on the TV. He had squandered not only his job and his marriage, but his entire life, reinventing himself by means of erasure, summoning thin air, as it were, from substance. He'd had everything, and then poof, in a magician's cloud of manufactured smoke, he had nothing. He hadn't exactly understood at first that this was what he was up to, couldn't have explained it even to himself, but the hurricane had merely completed the job, had hurled him forward, so that finally, lo and behold, he no longer recognized a single thing about his life. Lo and behold. One of his students had once written in a paper, and Henry had loved the mistake, lo and behold. He'd added it to the list of delightful errors he'd kept on an index card in his desk drawer, a list he no longer had because he hadn't bothered to return to pick up anything from school when he quit. Quit or was fired. Well, it didn't matter. Lo and behold, hammy downs, bona fide, tailgating, butt naked, asp burger, peach tree dish. <laughs> Utter silence. He remembered all of that. He remembered precisely where the index card was in the drawer. Remembered which kid had made which mistake. Remembered whether or not he had cringed or winced or laughed or felt a profound compassion for all that was good and kind and true and dumb in this world. Utter silence. That's what he needed. For a long time now, he couldn't remember how long, there had been a strange clatter in his head. He felt as though his brain had been scrambled, pithed, the way he'd been forced to do to the frogs in his high school biology class when Father Ferguson, skeletal and arthritic, his vestments reeking of formaldehyde and cherry pipe smoke, rattled from table to table to make sure none of the boys were engaged in extracurricular acts of torture. Your problem, Garrett, Father Ferguson had once scolded him, knocking his pipe against Henry's desk, is that you can't think straight. It was true, Henry knew. And it was still true. He could not think straight. He'd never been able to. But now it was worse. Now, in addition to his own crooked, winding, aimless thoughts, he heard not voices exactly, but clatter. He didn't have a better word for it. He tried, but couldn't come up with anything else that accurately captured the sensation. It wasn't static or interference or noise. It wasn't feedback or reverb or echoing. 
It was clatter. He was besieged by snatches of song lyrics, by lines from poems, by commercial jingles, by actors' stentorian recitations, by bits of conversation from years ago, from childhood, all of it looped and overlapping, endlessly repeated until for no reason he understood and suddenly stopped, his brain gone, going quiet. The clatter, despite the annoyance of it, despite the cacophony, made Henry feel oddly ecstatic, transported, brilliantly alive, as if his brain were finally letting go bit by bit of all the useless information he had acquired his whole life. He had never remembered his dreams until the clatter began, but now he woke up with long, intricately convoluted stories spilling through his thoughts, unable to distinguish sometimes what he had simply imagined from what he had actually seen or heard or done. The world, the very fact of his being alive in the world, seemed in these moments incredible to Henry, as if any minute now light would burst forth from his fingertips. Then the clatter, the ecstasy of the clatter, disappeared, and he was left feeling despondent, shaken, utterly and unalterably alone. His right eye, just the right eye, not the other, began watering for no reason, as if half of his face, half of him, had set about weeping. Amy, of course, had told him to get help, to talk to someone about what was going on. She told him from the very beginning, in fact, from the very first dream he'd had about his father, but Henry hadn't listened. Why should he listen? He already knew what was happening. He was merely following in his father's footsteps. He was gradually but inexorably losing his mind.